My name is David Flanagan. Um, I'm with a company called T Carta. Uh, we have a variety of marine geospatial products, um, but primarily satellite derived bathymetry. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking a little, about, a little bit about a project that we completed earlier this year um, in the Republic of Kiribati. Um, that was the very first thing we learned about Kiribati, was that it's Kiribati, not Kiribati. Um, and so just to get started, um, a little bit about Kiribati. Um, it is one of the most vulnerable areas in the world to sea level rise. The maximum elevation on any of the 36 islands is approximately two meters above sea level. Um, and again, the UN listed that as one of the most susceptible areas uh, due to climate change and sea level rise. Um, and so as, as a product of that, one of the things that they've done is they've already purchased land in Fiji um, as kind of a last resort. Uh, it's, you know, in case it rises too much and they have to vacate, uh, they will go to Fiji. Um, obviously, they don't want to do that. Um, and so they've uh, kind of, they've come up with this mantra called migration with dignity. And so that's if they have to um, leave Kiribati, uh, they're going to do so before any uh, natural or humanitarian disasters occur. Um, and so this has been in the news quite a bit, as you can see, um, in the New York Times, also in the World Bank has had articles on this. Um, but there are initiatives uh, to assist uh, these nations, such as Kiribati, um, and help them adapt to climate change and rising sea levels. Um, and in particular, the Commonwealth Marine Economies Program uh, is funded by the UK government, um, and that enables safe and sustainable marine economies across Commonwealth, small island developing states. Um, and Kiribati is one of those. So the main goal there is to foster uh, kind of a blue economy in these areas, um, because Kiribati uh, spans a, an area of approximately 3,000 nautical miles from end to end, um, and it has an EEZ that is about 30% larger uh, than the lower 48. So it covers a huge area. Um, so, so it's a lot for a small nation like that. Um, and so just kind of an overview of the project. Uh, back in December of 2018, we were contracted by the UKHO, the UK Hydrographic Office, um, to survey the waters of Kiribati, uh, the 36 islands there. Um, and several other atolls um, via satellite. Um, and that was by producing a range of produ products. Uh, we worked closely with Maxar, formerly Digital Globe, um, to, de to deliver an on-time um, product. Um, and it was the largest SDB project uh, contract awarded by an international hydrographic office at that time. Um, so just, I'm going to get back to the basics a little bit of actually what satellite derived bathymetry is in case, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Essentially what it does is it relates the water leaving radiance, um, or the surface reflectance of the water, uh, to the depth of the water column. Now we can only do SDB um, in optically shallow waters, meaning where we can see the bottom. Um, and this has been developing over the last 40 years. Um, in 1978 was really the first approach developed uh, by Lysinga, um, and this is really um, it's one of, it, it relates, um, it assumes that lower reflectance equals deep water. Um, and so there's some issues with that. Um, in general, uh, you know, we can have a, something like dark seaweed, uh, seagrass, um, that is spectrally very similar uh, to a dark area. Um, and so kind of to combat those problems, there's been a development um, really starting in the late 90s, um, all the way there's continuing development on this front. Um, and different ways to do that, and that's really the radi radiative transfer spectral matching method. And that's one of the, uh, that is the, um, that's what we use for our satellite derived bathymetry. Um, and in particular, we use an optimal estimation method um, that was developed back in 2012 by one of our uh, partners at Maxar. Um, and, and in addition with the actual SDB um, algorithm and capabilities, um, the satellites have gotten much better um, since the late 70s. Um, you know, especially in regard to the spatial and radiometric resolution. Uh, particularly, uh, what we do, one of our specialties, is using the Maxar Worldview fleet of satellites um, for satellite derived bathymetry. Um, and so these satellites have a positional accuracy of, a, of five meters, um, and our height accuracy for our depths are 10% of depth, or a half a meter. Um, and then we have a, a, a grid spacing of approximately two meters. Um, and recently we found out that we can actually, if, when we, because we are a partner with Maxar, we can actually order native resolution imagery. So we've done um, SDB grids as small as 1.6 meters. Um, and we can get down to about 25 meters. 
um, and you know, in prime optimal conditions, we can get down to about 30 meters. Um, so going back to Kiribati a little bit, uh, a lot of the charts uh, available before we did this project and a lot of just the information available in the area was very, very sparse. Uh, most of them still had you know, the old lead line surveys on there, uh, back from the late 1800s when the Penguin and the Challenger were surveying them. Um, so originally they were done with a lead line survey. Um, you, know, you have your lead on a line, that's exactly what it sounds, you drop it off your boat and that's your depth. Um, and the depths are actually very accurate because you're in constant contact with the bottom. However, um, because they were so old, obviously, before GPSs, um, their X and Y was based on a sextant. So the X and Y positioning of some of those points um, is not very accurate. And when you're thinking of a nautical chart, that's really not ideal. Um, and so this is an example of, of uh, lead line soundings that are still used on nautical charts today. Um, so this is uh, the island of Bimini in the Bahamas. It's only about 45 miles. Uh, from Fort Lauderdale. Um, and so then on the, on the left there uh, is the actual uh, nautical chart. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of uh, resolution there. Um, and then on the right is actually an SDB surface that we produced of this same area. Uh, so you have two meter coverage over the entire area. I mean, it really gives uh, you know, a new definition to this data. Um, we, you know, it, it's it's uh, one of those things that's really advantageous to have those continuous steps over the entire surface. Uh, and this is a worldwide issue, like I mentioned in Kiribati. Um, it's kind of the, the same situation where a lot of these charts have not been updated um, very often in the 1900s. Um, so hydrographic surveying in general, um, two of the best ways to do that are through multi-beam echo sounding and then also LIDAR. Um, you know, SDB will never rival these two uh, these two processes in terms of uh, accuracy and precision and uh, you know, resolution. Uh, but it does have some advantages, uh, particularly in an area like Kiribati that is so remote um, and so large, 3,000 nautical miles from end to end. Um, so it takes a lot of logistics uh, to get those two, um, all the equipment and manpower to those islands, keep those, that equipment up and running um, throughout the duration of the project. Um, and so this is just a, a, an estimate of what a LIDAR and multi-beam uh, you know, survey would cost in this area. Again, like I mentioned before, 3,000 nautical miles across. Um, just for some perspective, you put the U.S. on there, it's basically from Maine to Southern California. Um, and so of a multi-beam cost is around $30 million plus, a LIDAR cost is about $10 million plus, um, and we are able to do that um, much more economically for a much lower price. And we also, I can do it from my office in Denver. And so this is some of the, the satellites that we actually used for this project. Um, we used, like I mentioned, we used the Maxar fleet. Um, we, we used GOI, Worldview 2, 3, and 4. Um, and again, there's no mobilization or permitting required for this process. Um, there's a lot of repeatability. We can, you know, we have a huge archive of images to use. Um, so we can do repeat uh, collections um, and look at change detection. Um, it's fit for many purposes, and again, it's cost-effective and scalable. We can do you know, a, a very large area uh, with, with as many images as we can possibly get. So a little bit about our specific uh, satellite-derived bathymetry process. Um, it's based on a numerical inversion of the radiative transfer equation. Um, and so basically, we use a, we've used a uh, a program called Hydrolyte, um, and we've simulated a whole lot of different uh, radiances and things like that, and we store them in lookup tables. Um, and we give our software uh, an idea of what the bottom is, so we give it a, a bunch of uh, benthic substrate spectra, we give it a range of chlorophyll, uh, color dissolved organic matter, and non algal particles, and then it uses a non-linear optimization method uh, to find the best match between a modeled reflectance in those lookup tables and the actual reflectance uh, in the image. And so what, in the end, we get a single pixel approximation um, depth for each pixel. Um, and you know, we also have some, uh, a few other prod products that go along with this. Um, they're kind of, I don't like to say byproducts because that's not a good, good word for it, but we, we can, uh, for, for example, we produce a seabed reflectivity product, uh, which is essentially the seabed uh, corrected for the influence of water. So we can use that seabed reflectivity product um, to conduct a C4 classification, um, which is something that we also did for uh, this Kiribati project. 
Um, so this is one of the advantages of our partnership um, with Maxar in particular for this project. Um, and we, we continue to do this for a lot of projects uh, where there may be not a lot of suitable imagery, um, in particular this area, uh, pretty close to the equator, lots of clouds, a lot of sun glint. Equator is, uh, just due to the viewing angles of the satellites, has a lot of sun glint. Um, and so in particular for this project, uh, Maxar tasked over 300 images for us, which, uh, you know, it greatly improved our product um, and really allows us to get the maxim maximum coverage possible uh, in some of these areas. And so in addition uh, to, uh, you know, sun glint uh, and clouds, it's also like we saw in those pictures, it's also in the middle of the ocean. There's a lot of waves which uh, can influence uh, the satellite derived bathymetry uh, retrievals. Um, so this is just an example of the variety of different areas in Kiribati that we were actually able to get depths from, all the way from brackish lagoons um, to different types of coral reefs, um, and even some deep channels we were able to resolve depths uh, up to about 26 meters in this area. So, you know, SDB is very, uh, it can be used in a variety of different uh, water types um, as long as you have an idea of what those concentrations are. Um, so again, going back to, to the, the charting of Kiribati, on the left here is uh, the, the most updated nautical chart of Kiribati that we could find uh, for Tobuera Atoll. Um, and then on the right there is our actual SDB surface. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's a huge difference there between the two. Um, on the right, you know, we have continuous coverage over the entire lagoon, the outer reefs. Um, and then on the left there um, is really was probably too shallow uh, to be surveyed back in the uh, 1800s when this uh, chart was produced. Um, so a little close up of the lagoon there. Um, as you can see, again, there's no, actually no soundings um, on the inner lagoon. Um, it just says, uh, watch out for coral, basically. Um, but again, we, have, uh, we were able to get a continuous depth surface over that entire area. Um, and it's, it is really amazing to me. Um, you can kind of see the similarities in the, uh, in the chart and the SDB, where you know, they're really, actually really good at getting some of those coral reefs in the right places, just not necessarily the depths uh, associated with them. Um, and then again, if we look at the, uh, the lagoon entrance there uh, for Topoiran, um, you know, this is much better charted than the, the inner lagoon is. Uh, but still, there are some depths there that really didn't agree with, uh, you know, the, the SDB that we produced. And so we get this question a lot. Well, you know, that's great. You can, you say you have these depths for this area, but how do you know they're right? Um, and we have developed a couple different methods of doing that, and this was a good way to test uh, some of those methods, because um, obviously looking at uh, older charts is, is great for a kind of a cursory comparison, but we really want to be able to know that our depths are correct. Um, so one way we've done this is photogrammetric bathymetry, um, and that takes, it utilizes the geometry and the viewing angles of the satellite uh, to calculate the depth um, at specific points. Um, so in, in the middle of this slide here, um, with those yellow circles, those are some of the, the uh, different places where we would be able to get depths um, using this method. And again, that solves the need for in situ data for validation. Um, and we're able to use the same exact imagery that we use for SDB uh, to der derive these depths as well. Um, in addition, uh, I didn't add this in. Uh, it's a kind of a new capability for us. Uh, we just started using the ISAT-2 satellite. Um, it's a green laser satellite um, originally intended to measure um, uh, ice, as the name implies, uh, but actually does a very good job of measuring uh, bathymetry and near, th near shore bathymetry um, in general. So now in addition to the stereo points that we're able to produce, uh, we have lines of LIDAR that we can also use uh, to validate our depth surfaces. So like I mentioned before, we do have that seafloor classification product that we also produce. Um, and so this kind of allows us to create a holistic view of some of these islands, all the way from bathymetry. Uh, we have a seafloor classification product. Um, and then we are all, we, for this project in particular, we also produce a land classification product. Um, 
And so we have, you know, all the way from bathymetry to land use, land cover, um, and it's really a, a comprehensive um, look at the natural areas um, on these islands in Kiribati that haven't been, again, haven't been surveyed um, in a very long time. So kind of in summary of, of, of what we did for Kiribati, we surveyed 36 islands and atolls, um, produced over 3,000 square kilometers of coverage. Um, and again, I did that sitting at my desk in, uh, in Denver. So it's really amazing the, the amount of coverage that we can get just from satellite uh, derived bathymetry. Um, this was over a three month program. And again, Maxar collected 300 plus images for us in those three months. Um, and so, that, you know, that's great. We produced a lot of data for this project, but you know, how is that data being used? Um, and so part of how that data is being used, and it, it's being uh, used for future marine surveys as a reconnaissance tool uh, for multi-beam and or LIDAR surveys, um, identifying hazards to mariners, uh, sea level rise impact modeling, which is one of the big uh, emphasis of the this Coastal Marine Economies program for this particular project. Um, and in addition to that, storm surge and severe weather impact modeling, um, erosion wave action and flooding, um, and planning and design of natural and man-made defensive structures, um, including mangroves and seawalls. And again, that's all to combat uh, that sea level rise. And there's just a, a brief video uh, showing, uh, it's gonna show our land or our seafloor classification there a little bit. Um, yeah, just an overview of, of what some of those products look like. Um, and we actually have a, if you stop by our table out in the uh, hallway, we have a little bit longer video that shows a little bit more of those products. Um, and so like I said, uh, part of this was we produced this for the UKHO, um, and then they then in turn supplied this to the Kiribati government. Um, so in August 2019, they handed that data o over. Um, and again, these are just some of the, the headlines that were written about it. But it's being used um, to uh, you know, combat climate change um, and planning for those things in case sea level rise were to displace uh, some of these island nations. Um, and so just to, to kind of build, build on that a little bit, what, you know, what can SDB really do? Um, again, it's broad coverage at relatively low cost compared to other survey methods. It's a great way um, to, uh, you know, as a preliminary survey to, to other more uh, resource-intensive surveys. Um, again, it's highly repeatable. We can look at change detection. We've done this in a few different places. Um, and then, you know, a force multiplier for on-the-ground conservation efforts. Um, we can, you know, get an idea of what some of those classifications are before um, government agencies even go out to some of those sites. Um, and in particular, for remote areas such as Kiribati, it's a great resource because, again, there's no, no mobilization required, so we can do this from anywhere. Um, and especially for those countries that don't have hydrographic capabilities, um, and again, remote environmental and marine habitat analysis um, is a big portion of that. Um, so with that, thank you, um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you.